Roy, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? First of all, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I think it is the first interview I'm doing in English regarding my podcast and uh, everything that I'm doing. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Roy. I live in Israel, in Samaria. And as you can probably tell, I'm not a Native American. So I have <laughs> what we call in the industry bad English. Nevertheless, I will do my best. <laughs> Uh, I have a PhD in computer science. Uh, I wrote four books regarding motivation, intelligence, learning, how to excel yourself. Uh, I think that I lean towards the conservative side, but not on the political uh, spectrum, but on the philosophical spectrum. And in this context, what I mean is that I tend to... Put the responsibility on the self. I want people to improve themselves and not, you know, to count on the government, to count on society. If you want to improve yourself, change yourself. The power to change is within yourself, which is extremely important to me. And this is why I have my podcast and my YouTube channel where I speak about science, education, about how to better yourself with knowledge. Cool. Tell me more. Um, what do you do on your podcast normally? What was the most recent thing you've talked about? Um, <clears throat> this is a funny story. The podcast started, I think, in the, co in, in the COVID pandemic. And my wife, she, she has a, gr a, a big green skin studio because she is a photographer and an editor for, for the government. And she told me, you know, we should do a podcast. And I told her, mm, we live in Samaria. No one will come to Samaria for a podcast. It's, it is a silly idea. And nevertheless, she constructed the, the whole thing. And when the COVID pandemic started, by the way, I also used to be a magician, a magician mentalist. And all the shows, all the events, all the gigs were canceled just at once. And I just sat in my home, very lonely, had nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do. And I said, okay, what can I do? So I started speaking with some friends and those friends became more and more important and more and more influential. And uh, this is how I get to speak with, I think, the most important and influential scholars from all around the world. And what we discuss is science, philosophy, part of it is religion, artificial intelligence, intelligence, chemistry, physics, all all the good stuff. I, I, I'm truly privileged to speak with those people. Cool. So what is your position on religion and Judaism? Uh, first of all, I'm an Orthodox Jew. Uh, like Remer used to say, I think in one of the episodes, told Seinfeld, old school, old school. I'm the old school Orthodox Jew. And I think that this is my perspective. But... I think that in Israel, and you live in, in the U.S.? Yep. So I would think it's like a modern orthodox because, you know, I'm on YouTube and I'm uh, engaged in the university and I conduct a very modern life. So I guess this, we don't have the term modern, modern orthodox in Israel, but I think that this is, very similar to what modern orthodox is in the U.S. What is modern orthodoxy? Uh, I think that modern orthodoxy is, I, is to keep both ends of the rope in one perspective or in, in one end uh, to gain and to benefit most of what technology and Western society has given us which is not only technology, but is, I think science. Yes, science, women's rights, etc. All the, all the good stuff that Western society has given us. And on the other end of the rope, uh, to, become, to stay loyal to your faith and to your tradition as, as an as a Orthodox Jew, as a practicing Jew, I would call it. It's a practicing Jew. 
Do you see there's a conflict between having orthodox positions and science, say? This is a very good question, but uh, I will give the first the, uh, the short answer and then the longer answer. The short answer is no. And this is why I'm here. I think that the short answer is definitely no. But before I keep, before I'm uh, giving the long answer, I just want to say that I have never participated in those kinds of debates because I really believe in in everyone should do whatever he wants, and I really don't into you know convince people of one thing of or another. So this is extremely important, and. The other aspect of this is that my that my ability to present or to communicate my beliefs in English, I think, is somewhere limited. So I will do my best, okay? But again, I, I, I'm not into this. Uh, I, I'm not usually go into those kinds of con con conversations. And when I think your assistant emailed me and said, you know, would you like to come to Tom Jump? I said, mm, it's like a debate, atheist debate. And I'm not into this. But then I watch your YouTube channel and, it, and I saw that you were interested in an Instagram girlfriend. And I thought, oh, this is a great guy. I want to speak with him. So <laughs> I really don't care. Uh, and I think that the longer answer is no. But... Yes, usually people think if you consider Genesis, for example, to be a book that represents science, there is a very big difference between science as we know it and Genesis. What we call in, I think, uh, in the U.S. creationist. I must tell you that I've never, and this is important, I've never met any Israeli creationist to the extent of what you consider creationist. I just came across, you know, five years ago, I came across the, the notion of creationist and I, um, and I truly understand what that means in the U.S. I said, wow, I have never met someone like this. Never. Yeah, they're uh, pretty interesting. Take the Bible um, more than literally, I guess. Take the world 6,000 years old. It's very interesting concept. So what do you talk By about? By the way, I think... I, I, I think that the six thousand years, uh, the six six thousand years is correct. But the idea is, where is the starting point? The starting point is not the beginning of the universe. I truly believe that this uh, this calendar is the calendar is true, but the but the first point of this calendar is not the beginning of of the universe. Is when the father. I don't know how to say it in English. But, you know, Ed, Adam had three children. I think it was, I don't know, again, sorry, because I don't know how to translate into English, but it was Cain, yes? Abel. Please help me. Cain, Abel. Cain, Abel, and then the, the third one, the Shet. So from the birth of the father of Shet, we count approximately 6,000 years. But it's not from the beginning of the universe. So do you think they literally existed, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, Abraham? I wanted to believe. I really don't. I, first, I don't know. First, I don't know. Uh, the concept of Adam, just a second. Adam and Eve, I don't know if they truly exist. I teach a guide for the perplexed, which I think is the most important philoso Jewish philosophical book written in the Middle Ages. And Maimonides itself said, guys, it's an analogy. You know, the story of heaven not really happened. It's, it's just an analogy to the powers within man itself. And this is one notion. And since I'm a, rational, I'm a rationalist, I tend to go with Maimonides. So this whole story can be like an analogy to the powers that lies within every human being, you know, the Adam and Eve and the snake, those those powers lives within each one of each one of us. Sure. <clears throat> I definitely agree it could be used as an analogy. My position is that I don't think most of them literally existed. I think the first person in the Bible who literally existed was uh, King David. 
So okay, so now I think I I would go with uh, I would go with Shet and we'll go with Noah. But again, this is my belief, and 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 I think you know the most important thing is you can believe that you know they existed or not existed. I but and when we when we encounter the Bible as an important book to Western society. And I think no one denies that the Bible was and is an important book in Western civilization. And we ask, what can we learn from the Bible? What message could we learn from the Bible? We learn from the Greeks, although we don't agree with the Greeks. We learn, with, we learn from Shakespeare. We learn from Tolstoy. We learn from all the great authors in history. What lesson could be learned from the stories of the Bible. And the concept of whether the stories of the Bible represent historical fact is important. But many people will say, this is not the most important thing. Can you gain a moral or a fundamental message to your life in the 21st century from the Bible? And my answer is definitely yes. This is why those this is why this book is so important. What do you think the message is that we can get for the 21st century? Wow. You know, I'm doing, again, I don't know how to say it in English. So you please, uh, <laughs> you need to help me. But there is idea of a parashat shavua, which means that each, seg each, each week, each Sabbath, we read a portion of the Torah, of the Old Testament, in in all the synagogues, in all in all the, the world, and what I'm doing is to take just one verse or two verses from the from the relevant section in each week, and connect it to the concept or to the idea of what message can be learned. Okay, uh, I will just give you a few examples. Okay. Uh, the idea of Moses, that we don't hear anything about his children. Okay, we don't hear anything about his children. We we hear and we read many things regarding the children of Aaron, his brother, but we don't say and we don't hear and we don't read and we don't know almost anything regarding his children. And I think Dennis Prager once mentioned that this is very important. Great men has tendency you know, to forget their children because they invest so much energy in so in so many great things, you know, leading the country, leading leading the, the, the sons of Israel to the promised land that sometimes their own family is forgotten. And I think that this is a great message, you know, you know, how to balance your career. Many messages can be learned from the from the Bible, from the Torah. Many, many messages. This is why it's so important. This is why you read the classical thing. Hamlet is important because although it was written 400 years ago, you can still extract relevant messages from Hamlet to your own life. Do you think you can get uh, negative or bad messages just as well as you can get good messages? This is a good, this is a good question. I don't know what I don't know how to answer it. This is a good question. This is a truly good question. I really don't know how to answer it. Because as an atheist, when we read the Bible, we get we see more negative messages and we see, especially here in America, many Christians interpreting the Bible in ways that can justify their bad behavior, their bigotry or whatever. So like one of the things that's that's obvious is like uh, the Bible tells you how to treat your slave. If you could beat your slave as long as it doesn't die and recovers in a few few weeks, he's fine. Doesn't matter. Um, you could own your slave forever if you give him a wife. You can, if someone uh, a rapist, someone rapes a woman, then the woman has to become his wife. Um, there's lots of bad things like that where 
God commands killing and death. Uh, he commands Jephthah to... Jephthah makes a promise that when he gets home after he wins a battle, he's going to sacrifice the first thing that comes to his door. It's his daughter. <laughs> As they say, the funny story. <laughs> and similar stories where God commands sacrifice. And remember, there was a story where... <clears throat> There were some men chasing an angel, and he went into, I think it was Lot's house, and uh, Lot sacrificed, yeah, gave yeah. them a prostitute instead, and they violated the prostitute. And no prostitute. Was, his own daughters. Yeah, his own daughters, that's right. His yeah. own daughters. Yeah. No he, he manipulated. He gives his own daughter for a, for a group rape. Yes, <laughs> this is a very bad thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, and again, I, 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 I'm not into usually those kinds of conversation. Nevertheless, I will give you my point of view. You are absolutely right that the Torah, or if you want, you can call it the Old Testament, was given in a certain time and place. And in that certain time of place, you know, morality and all norms were very, were vastly different. You know, slaves were legal in the U.S. up until, you know, 100 years ago. Even the Second Amendment, you know, I recently read about the Second Amendment and just a second, if a slave, you need to return the slave to uh, to his rightful owner, etc. In the U.S., the most democratic state ever existed, okay? So the norms are constantly getting changed, are constantly changing. And... I think that what Sam Harris does is reading Leviticus in in his modern eyes is unfair. Okay, this is unfair. Now, I th there is one thing for sure: we can't take the the Old Testament as a text and live by the Old Testament. This is absolutely sure. But as a Jewish, we have the interpretations, and we. We truly believe, and this is what I believe, that the inter the, th those interpretations were given alongside with the text itself. And this is very important. The idea is, the idea is that some of the things that we consider to be immoral, when you consider them, you know, when you look at death, become very, very moral. But one thing that you could ask, and this is a good question, is, you know, I go with you. Maybe before, maybe 3,000 years ago when the Torah was given, uh, it was the highly moral standard ever existed on planet Earth. But now we are 3,000 years older. We are much uh, more modern. We are more moral. Therefore, the Torah is irrelevant now. It was relevant 3,000 years ago. Very good. But it's irrelevant now because now we don't need the Torah to, to tell us that slave is uh, is ethical bad. Do you get my point? Sure, um, but do you think? And this, and first, this is this is a good question. This is good question, and therefore the idea of constant interpretation is mandatory. If you you know there was a rabbi in I think approximately in the 11th century, that he said that if you take the laws of the Torah and we try to make a modern state more than 1,000 years ago, the state will fall apart. We need to modify the law, you know, to adjust for the modern state. And he said it 1,000 years ago, okay? 1,000. If you don't know who I'm talking about, and I'm talking to mainly Israeli here or Jewish, I'm talking about the Rashba. The Rashba said that if you take the laws of the Torah and okay, say, okay, let's construct a state from those laws, mm, it won't work. Okay? The idea of constant interpretation, the idea of, you know, different treatment to women. Women were treated very bad in ancient times, both in Jewish and in Christian and in Paganic world. I believe that women were treated much better in Jewish culture than in Christian culture. Nevertheless, women need to be treated differently nowadays. 
okay? And this is part of the constant interpretation. What we get is just the gist and, the, and, and, and some way to, and the method to interpret it, to interpret the Torah for every generation. I think that goes to my main question because you said that um, the benefit of the Torah is the fact that we can get values for modern day society. No, 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 I didn't say. I say that the, the, the benefit for you as an atheist, like you say, okay, Shakespeare, you know, Hamlet is a very, it's, it's, immoral, it's immoral story. And uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey by, by Homer are terrible stories. Nevertheless, you can get some juice, some very good gems out of those stories, even though you don't subscribe to everything that's represented in those stories. This is what I tell you. As an atheist, you can gain some wisdom from this book. Sure, but uh, the, it seems like what you're doing, what we do when we get wisdom from those kinds of documents, is that we impose our modern values onto them and try to read the important or the good bits in um, by taking the fact that we have to reinterpret it with our modern lens. Um, but it seems like the book as a document could be improved. It could be better. It could be, it would be more moral if it was more representative of our values today than it was of our values back then. Um, would you, would you agree that the book could be more moral and it could express a more moral way of life than the one it does? If you, I, 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 I can say, I think the following thing, and this is very important because I'm not speaking in the name of Judaism, I'm speaking just in my name, okay? It's very important, okay? I'm not trying to represent anyone. And, and again, some of the things that I wanted to speak about, you know, was about intelligence and the idea of how, uh, how intelligence, I think, uh, correlate very well with what we just uh, uh, spoke, but if you, if your, if your question is, if the Torah were given, were given now, would it be different? So my answer is definitely yes, definitely yes. The idea of slaves would have been different, very yes. Now we we can say you know that modern modern high tech employees are like uh, are like slaves, but they are not like slaves. They are like slaves in some way. It's like Nassim Nikola Taleb once said, the main difference between modern slaves and ancient slaves, that ancient slaves didn't uh, had to suck to the boss, you know, to, to be nice to the boss. Uh, but yes, the Torah would, if the Torah would have written nowadays, if it would have written differently, yes. It doesn't mean, from from my perspective, that the Torah is not internal. Well, from my like from my perspective, I would think that if there was a book that was written by the creator of the universe, he could have written something that was timelessly good. Like I think that he could have added like, "What is timelessly good? Give me just one thing that is timelessly mm -hmm. good." There is a great quote by just Will Duant that if you take all the things there in some point in Western society were holy to one group and take out all the things that in one point in Western society were very bad for another group, you will end up with an empty jar. So what can you say that one thing could be internal, no matter what the, what the context is? Don't own other human beings as property. Don't rape. Uh, don't force people to do things they don't consent to doing. Those all seem pretty timeless. Uh, as okay, so let's take one by one. Uh, don't rape. I think it's it's a very good idea. It's a very good idea. Let me just tell you that in Israel, the law about a husband raping his own wife was only changed twenty years ago in Israel. I don't know what what's the matter in in the US, but in Israel, and I think in, or in other Western societies, the idea of rape was, was irrelevant to the, to the husband until much recently. This is one thing. So we didn't 
get the idea of don't rape up until 20 years ago in the context of husband and wife. This is one thing. And don't force anyone to do what he doesn't want. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a, I'm a teacher at the university. I have four kids, you know. This is BS. You always tell people, you always force people to do things that they want, don't know. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. You know, life is complicated. Life is complex. Sometimes you want to enforce people to do what they uh, need for their own good. Okay? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think, but I think if there was a creator of the universe, he could have told us what the correct moral way was from the beginning. So he could have just said, rape is always wrong. He could have just given us that as a doctrine. Owning humans is always wrong. And the perfect moral way of being would be a way where no one was ever forced to do anything they don't consent to doing. I think if there was an ultimate creator of the universe, he could have written those principles into a book and it would have been timelessly true. Do you have kids? <laughs> No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, not yet. Yep. But the idea is, okay, let's let's take your let's take your idea, which I think is a great idea. Okay. Let's you know, let's write on a piece of paper the 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 most important fundamental internal thing, internal thing, and say, okay, this is what what we need to strive for. This is great. But I think and hive kids. It doesn't go like it doesn't go like this with kids. You need, you know, if your kid is in just one level, okay, you don't, you can't say, okay, just learn calculus, okay, just a second. Let me learn the multiplication table, just one by one. Let me do addition, subtraction, multiplication, okay. And the idea is that what we think is the humanity always better and excel and become from one from just a second. Where is the where is the camera? Oh, this is the camera. Okay, <laughs> and you know human rights, human rights. Magna Carta was invented one. Magna Carta was invented one thousand years ago. Human rights, as Locke Montesquieu, were invented or formulated in the modern sense three three hundred years ago. If we see the progress in humanity, you can't go to the Quaminion three thousand. Uh, 30,000 years ago and say, okay, this is what you should do. Don't kill, don't kill your other, uh, <laughs> don't kill other people. It doesn't go like this, okay? And what you need to do is to go and progress yourself. And this is why the Torah was given in a certain place in a certain time for a certain morality of humanity. Okay, and we better ourselves every day. Now, my question to you is, if I may, we have sure. basically the same large, uh, the same size YouTube channels. I have approximately uh, 16,000, you have approximately 14,000, and I see your numbers. And from, um, I know that this is, this is no, this is not how you, how you get rich. Okay. You are not doing it for the money, what you're doing right now. We are not doing it for, for the money. N neither you nor I. And my question is, what is your call? Why are you doing it? Why, why do you invest so much time and energy in this channel? I can tell you why I invest. I want people to learn more, to know more. I want people to use knowledge and science and online courses to better themselves, to conduct a better life. This is my call. And my question is to you, what is your call? The money is actually a big part of it for me. I do make a decent amount of money on this, but... Ah, okay, so... <clears throat> I canceled my question. I'm sorry. Well, I, it was a good question. So my other motivation is to promote my model of morality. I believe there is an objective morality. And I think that the best word, way the world could be would be a world where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. And my goal is to try to promote that idea of morality and to try to make the world closer to that extreme as much as we can. So I'm working on 
trying to start a 501c nonprofit church to provide uh, affordable housing to people because that's the best way to make people more free, have less obligations to have less housing costs because that's one of the biggest uh, costs in America, at least for people that they don't really want to have to pay. And so my goal is to promote my morality and try to make the world as close to the best of all possible worlds that I can. Okay. But you started with the money, which is great. Okay. <laughs> because my numbers, I, and I thought your numbers, because, okay, it, it is maybe PayPal and, and, and Patreon, which is very important. The, the idea is uh, you want, like, you want, in, it, it, it's like in, in the cave story of Plato, you want to get people out of the cave. Okay. You want people to, to see the light. This is what I thought is basically the idea, the premise. Sure. By the way, I don't believe in objective morality. Oh, really? I no, no. Just a second. I don't believe, and this is very important to distinguish. We have a we have moral atheist and we have immoral theist. We have this. <laughs> we have good people and bad people in all sides of the spectrum. N My idea is that the. In intellectual justification for objective morality is very hard when you don't have God. Now, it's not just me. I think that many people say, and I heard some Harris arguments that you can, you know, extract, you, uh, extract morality from reason. And I think with even without Hume that you cannot derive out from an is that some Harris is not convincing. He's so, a great man, but he's not yeah. convincing. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like Sam Harris's well-being model very much. But so, why do you think that morality would be harder to ground under naturalism than a god? Why do you think that a god could do it when a natural force couldn't? What do you mean by natural force? Just anything. So, like a platonic object, a priori abstract. There's lots of different potential things that morality could be. Um, instead of it being grounded in God's nature, it just could be grounded in the universe's nature. Why would that be any less real? Just a second. Be, 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 before we move on, I think that some of the things that we speak about, you know, the, we say the word God many, many times. And usually when I debate secular people in Israel or atheists in Israel, my, uh, my only... My, most quoted sentence is the God that you don't believe in, neither do I. Okay? So if God for you as a concept of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, you know, the big uh, the big old guy with the purple uh, dress, I don't know, and you know, this painted everything, and God is like, you know, the the, the, the guy from the bank that you pray to get the parking spot in the middle of in the middle of New York this is not what i believe in god okay so what is the god that you don't believe in uh, i define god as a uh, mind that created the universe that's it okay and from your perspective the you know the blind watchman like 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 the Dawkins argument of everything in existence everything in reality came to existence out of randomness this is basically the idea i think it was determined by physical forces so randomness could be a part of it but i think it's determined by physical forces and where do the physical forces came about Quantum fields. Quantum fields are the fundamental thing in the universe. They are uncreated. They exist outside of space and time, and they created everything else. So you, it's like there is a great. Are you familiar with a guy named Terence McKenna? Terence yes. McKenna. He yeah. introduced the concept of uh, I don't need this Frankenstein. This uh, just a second. Frankenstein. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <clears throat> uh, hallucination and he said that modern science based off the principle of give me one miracle and i will explain everything and the one miracle is that the whole the whole universe with all existence and all the forces and all the physical forces 
where you just pop out of existence in, from nowhere. And from that, I can explain everything. And uh, if I say, you know, if I would have said, you know, mm, what do you mean by quantum gravity that, that, that exists out of, outside of space and time? I really don't understand what does it mean because I, I exist in space and time. So it's very hard for me to grasp this notion. It's like that you believe in as, as a mumbo jumbo thing. Would you agree? Uh, no, I, I would not agree. I would think that in we have evidence to indicate quantum fields exist. We have very good evidence to indicate they exist. And we can show that you can solve the mathematical equations for general and special relativity by removing time and space. Time and space are represented by lambda. It's an actual thing. <laughs> so quantum fields exist in a different field. They're a different field. So space-time is a field. Quantum fields are a different field. So getting rid of space-time isn't really super impressive. We exist in space-time, but it's just one field. It's not everything. It's not It's not required for anything to happen. It's just one kind of a field. And so you can have other kinds of fields. And there's a large body of evidence that indicates these do exist. Um, but what whereas... do you mean when you say field? You know, I major in physics, and I, I, I you need to... We need to have assumptions regarding all the things. It's like, you know, the multiverse or, or the multi-universe theory in quantum, uh, in, in quantum mechanics. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? I would say that, you know, the idea of a mathematical formula like the Pythagorean triangle, okay, is exist outside space and time. Okay, this is great. But this is not say nothing about reality. When you say quantum field and you say, okay, those fields and the laws, the physical law derived from those fields exist and continue to exist and be the same today, tomorrow, yesterday, I can ask why? Why should they be the same. Why should the same law applies to the chemical element in my finger and the forest galaxies in the universe are the same laws? And this is a good question. It's not me possessing this question. You know, many great physicists possess uh, propose this question. I think it's it's a good fundamental question. Would you agree? Uh, sure. And the answer is, I don't know. There's a... What I define as a quantum field is an actual object. It's a physical object. It's not just a mathematical formula. So it's not abstract. And so it's outside of space and time, but still a physical object because it's a different field. Is it space time is a field and there are other fields and they equally as well exist. But physical abstract objects. objects cannot, but just a second, physical object cannot exist outside space and time, no? Sure it can. Why wouldn't it be able to? I think I think you're confusing space and time as being all things, but space and time are not all things. Space and time is one kind of a thing, and there are other kinds of things, other fields, that are not space-time fields. It's like there's a lots of different fields. Space and time is two kinds of fields, or one kind of field, and there are other kinds of fields that are not space and time. They're different fields. But they're all physical fields. They're all physical things. Not like abstract objects don't exist in fields. They're, they don't exist anywhere. But there are different kinds of fields. Space and time is one kind of a field. And then space and time can be results of other fields. You know, I, I read now the comments. And uh, for one, they said, they said, he studied physics and he liked the idea of personality outside of space, time, better than a field. Okay, dude. By the way, I don't like the idea of personality. I, 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 this is exactly what I said. But from those uh, comments, I see that you... You know, our audience right now is basically atheist. You know, it's like a wrestling debate. Let's go for the atheist. And uh, mumbo jumbo, it, it's it's a, the idea of, I, I really try when I try uh, and when I conduct conversations and you're great, by the way, you're great. Right. You're doing a great uh, role as an interviewer. You're really great but the idea is I, I truly present i truly want to present you know the other perspective 
And from what I see, and I read the comments now, and I read the comments on, on your YouTube channels, it is like, okay, let's see how we can uh, destroy all religious uh, argument. And I think that we lose something because we don't talk. You already convince, you convince the already convinced. You get my point? I guess so. Like if your goal was to try to educate the audience on new things, that would be true. From my perspective, my goal is to challenge all ideas to learn more about them. The way I learn is by challenging ideas, trying to deconstruct them. And if they can't be deconstructed, then I find them more compelling. And so the way I learn about something is by trying to deconstruct it. And if I can't, then it is usually a better idea. And so as opposed to simply presenting information, uh, the way I try to evaluate it is by seeing if I can find weaknesses in it, poke holes in it. And it's just the way I learn. This is great. And which goes back to the refutation theory by Karl Popper. But I had a talk with Rupert Sheldrake uh, on, on the podcast. And he, he wrote a, a book named Science Set Free. And in this book, he said that science is stuck in dogmas. And he presented 10 different dogmas. For example, that the laws of the universe, the constant of the universe are always constant. And he is not religious in any way, shape, or form. But he said, listen, we have evidence that the speed of light was changing dramatically in the 30s and 40s. In effect, nowadays, the speed of light is defined by the matter is defined in the terms of speed of light, which means that if the speed of light is actual changing, we will never know it. And what he said, and I asked him about the refutation theory of Popper and say, this is great. But when you encounter a new idea, a new idea, before you try to refute or weaken the idea, just try to understand the idea as much as you can. The refutation theory of the refutation process is great, really, really great. But before we do the refutation, let's see, let's let help me strengthen your argument. And one of the guys on, on the chat said, uh, your guy doesn't have a personality. So the idea of, of the Jewish God or somebody else of the Jewish God says, yes, that God is unchangeable. Yes, and if it's unchangeable, so it doesn't react to what you do, okay? The laws of nature, the, the, the laws of reality, what you might call karma, is how God operates in, in reality. And we have several lines of, we have this, you know, the gravity, which is law. But if you do good, good will come to you. This is also law of reality. This is a different law of reality than the gravity or the second uh, law of Newton. But we have different laws of reality that reality works by. And this is how God operates in reality. So a couple things there that I wanted to comment on. I'm very familiar with uh, Rupert Sheldrake. And I disagree with his I disagree with his dogmas. I don't think science has those dogmas. Like for example, we don't think the laws of physics have been constant forever. In fact, we think they have changed. I don't think the speed of light has changed. Uh, but for example, gravity used to be repulsive at the early universe, goose early universal inflation. So we don't we don't presuppose that the laws of physics have always been the same. What we do is we say, as far as we can tell, the laws of physics um, that have predicted the orbit of Mercury or whatever, Newtonian or Einstein's general relativity, uh, predict it back and forward in time, not just the current time. And they seem to accurately predict what would be the case if that was going to happen. So we test it. We say, can we launch a rocket uh, to go around each of the planets in orbits for the next three years? to get out of the solar system, and they do. It's, we successfully predicted the exact orbit that it would travel through the solar system and got it right. That's pretty good evidence to conclude that the laws of physics have been constant, um, and you can infer that inductively to be the past. And so we don't have any reason to think the laws of physics have changed. I don't I don't know what he means when he says that the laws, that the speed of light has was slower 
or faster in the 1930s and 40s. That would be very strange uh, because the speed of light governs how fast electrons move around particles. And so if the speed increases or decreases, the radius No, of yeah, the idea is the speed of light is one divided the square root of mu zero epsilon zero. And what he says is that mu zero epsilon zero is something changing. But there is another way that if you do all the Maxwell equations and not partial derivative, but you do it with full derivative, you get to a notion of speed of light as a function of t. What you said right now about science don't, doesn't have dogmas, Sheldrake himself told me that his book uh, came out, set science free. The editor of Nature compared his book to Mein Kampf, to Hitler Mein Kampf, okay? And this is a very inappropriate comparison for something that, you know, a hypothesis about nature and about science and about, you know, the measure or how to do good science. If you compare set science free to Mein Kampf, this is hard not to think about dogmas in science. Well, Would I, I agree. agree. I agree, but I don't think that one guy comparing it to Mein Kampf is equivalent to there being in a dogma in the entire field of science. I think that, yes, there are some people who hold positions very strongly and think any disagreement... There is no with science, position... only scientists. Okay, I go I go with you. I go with you. There is a, what, what is science? We only have scientists. Science doesn't have dogma. Scientists have. Very good. Okay. Well, I think that's... I would, I would equate the two, but so I'd say that that one guy disagreeing with Sheldrake is not a dogma in the majority or consensus of scientists. It's that one guy. I don't think there is a consensus of dogmatism because I think that the whole point of science is very much like my point, is that we learn by deconstructing. So any worldview, any idea, they're all fine. You can start with whatever idea you want. But you have to have some method that could differentiate that idea from imagination. Uh, the method we use, use for that is novel testable predictions. You predict the future. If you can predict the future, you have evidence of whatever ridiculous idea you want. It doesn't make a difference what it is. Magical leprechauns, if you can predict the future, you have evidence of magical leprechauns. But Sheldrake and other post hoc philosophers essentially are just taking the scientific method and critiquing it, but have nothing to show for it. They can't predict the future. They don't give us any new information. They don't have any way to verify their claims. They're just post hoc claims. And post hoc claims are perfectly valid. Like you, can, you can justify anything with post hoc claims. You could say the whole world was created five minutes ago by a magical leprechaun, and it's consistent with all of the data. There's no way to disprove that. But there's no way to confirm it. There's no way to say, if this is true, here is some new information about the world we'll discover under this experiment. And that's why it's not accepted. That's why Sheldrake's positions are not accepted, because it's just uh, one of the infinitely many post hoc interpretations of the data, but doesn't give us anything new to set it apart. And that's what you need to set an idea apart is something new that we haven't discovered yet. Some, some new information about the universe we didn't know yet prior to us knowing it. Then you have a reason to believe that your hypothesis is true. And the universality of certain laws, speed of light, gives us gave us that. Uh, consistency of gravity and space-time gave us that. All the different, the Lorentz transformations gave us that. Quantum fields and the Casimir effect gave us that. And so in physics, all of those things that he's critiquing as these dogmas are things that have been demonstrated to be able to predict the future and get it right consistently. And his critiques have not, don't have that ability, which is why they're not taken seriously. I don't think it's like Mein Kampf at all. I don't think I don't think his book is like Mein Kampf. I think his critiques are incorrect. I think it's post hoc reasoning, which is why I think most scientists don't take him seriously. But I do agree with you that it's not correct to compare it to Mein Kampf. I think that's a little extreme. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned karma. You said that if you do good things, good things will happen to you. I don't. That's. I wish that were true, but I don't think it is true. I think that is often false. You know, there is a great, a great psychological experiment. You know that if you if you want to view the a correlation between many things, you will see that people who answer telephone polls live longer. Which say, okay, this is strange why there should be a connection between answering telephone polls, you know, on 7 p.m. when you just before dinner time with your family and you, you just, you know, invest the time in some stupid telephone poll and live longer. And the idea is it's not the telephone poll. 
It's the kind of a person who answers telephone calls. It's a kind of person who let other car wave in in the traffic. The idea is that if you conduct your life in a certain way, you know, it's like there, it's like there is no reality. There is just how you perceive reality. If you perceive reality in in a better way, reality will be better. Recently, I came across a book by Bernie Siegel, Dr. Bernie Siegel. It's called Love, Medicine, and Miracles. And he was a doctor, a, a, a surgeon, a, a cancer surgeon. And he, he was not religious again, but he was started to see many patterns of people with just healed from cancer. So, okay, what is the common denominator between all those people? And he said, listen, the human mind and the human body have great power, great healing power. Now, it's not Bernie Siegel. I think it was Voltaire who said that the job of the doctor is to entertain the patient while nature heals him. This is a great quote. But in order for you to get to this state of mind, to this notion, you need to be the, a, a very specific kind of person. Okay? Persons that see reality in very particular glasses. And I think this is what it is all about, helping you see reality in better glasses. Okay? So when I think of karma, the first thing that comes to mind is the Mein Kampf example. Like I would imagine that the, the Jews, who were most of them who were enslaved and went to the gas chambers, were very nice people, very good, kind people. And I imagine... The, the jailers were probably not very good people, or at least not at that particular time when they were gassing them. Mm -hmm. But the jailers lived quite a bit longer than the people who were being gassed. Um, and so quite. using that very, very extreme example, it seems like people who can be very bad can live for much longer. For example, dictators, uh, people who conquer uh, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, do very bad things, but they live and propagate uh, far better lives than many of the people who are under them, who are their victims. And so using the most extreme examples, it seems like karma doesn't seem to accurately represent reality. What do now, you about... mean? No, no, no. This is a great example. This is a great example. And I think what we are missing here, first, first, the idea of evil in reality is a very profound problem in all religion. Okay? First, this is a very profound problem in all religion. I think even King David, yes? King David in Psalms, I don't know how to say it in English, but he say, how the evil man prosper. It is not fair. It's, it's unfair. Okay. Even David said, mm, it's unfair. David was a good man, but was hunted by, by King Saul. And it was unfair, but he, he did nothing bad. Okay. Up until this point. So you have a very good point. The idea is that you can lead better life, even in the harshest scenarios, even in concentration camps, okay? Even in concentration camps. Let me give you the, the one example that I love so much. Natan Shuansky. He was, a, he was prisoner for the Soviet Union for, I think, 20 years. And he wanted to go to, he wanted to uh, go to the land of Israel and he was a prison for 20 years. And he told the judge in his sentence, you set me to jail, but I am more free than you because my mind is free. My body is not. I'm chained in this very, very small room. Okay. So the idea of free, of, of there is like the, the free of the mind and free of the body. And you know, like many in the U.S. and well-developed countries, that there is an inverse correlation. The more physical comfort you have, sometimes you become more depressed, more, uh, more suicide, yes? More psychiatric pills, et cetera. There is a, this is... This is why we Westerns so obsessed with India, because India in the physical level, they have nothing. But on the spiritual level, they have wow. Okay? And we envy in India. 
We want this freedom of the mind. We have everything. We have this great couch. Great couch, okay? But sometimes this couch is not enough. Oh, sure, I would agree. But I think that was idle idle minds or idle hands lead to a corrupt mind or something along those lines. I forget, I forget what the quote is. When you have more time to think and you're not, you don't have to literally work every minute of every day, um, and that can lead to depression. Higher intelligence leads to depression. People who are more intelligent tend to have more depression. So if you have malnutrition and that lowers your intelligence, you're less likely to be depressed, even though you have an objectively worse life. So I think I don't think that the level of happiness is an accurate measure of how we should determine whether or not someone is truly living their best life or whether or not they have a, a valuable life in that just because they feel happy. I think you can make people feel happy with miserable life. People can be deluded um, and deceived by religious figures or uh, indoctrinated by cults or all kinds of things to make them feel happy or think they're happy when they're genuinely don't have fantastic lives. And so I think that there was a study done on money, um, how happy you are based on how much money you have. And it goes up to about 50 to 60,000. There's a, a sharp increase where you go from, if you have less than that, you're really by, depressed. By Daniel Kahneman. Yep. And after yep. after $60,000, which is just uh, let all, all, all the viewers say, in $60,000 in the US, annual salary is just, I think, a little bit below average. And after $60,000, there is no correlation whatsoever between money and happiness, which well, means... it went up. It still went up, but it very slowly. It was very, very quick, and then it went up slowly. When I spoke with Danny Kahneman, he said, <sighs> this was flat, okay? And, uh, and, I spoke, and I spoke with Danny, okay? I, I, want, I want to dispute that in the book, in the actual paper. It actually shows it growing up, but very slightly. So the, after the 50,000 mark, it's a very steep increase. But after that, it goes up only a little bit. So it still goes up, but a tiny amount. So it's not, not a significant degree um, statistically. So it's not correlated to the amount of happiness. The amount of money you get is no longer correlated to the amount of happiness you get above that rank. But it still goes up a tiny amount. I think, you know, the most important idea that I even your viewers and your listeners and, and all the guys on, on, on the chat can get is Western society, and we are part of Western society. I'm an Orthodox Jew living in Israel. You're an atheist, Christian atheist. You, you say Christian a atheist? Uh, no, it's more like a Jordan Peterson. I'm just an atheist. Just an atheist. Okay, but, but you're not Jewish. No, I was okay, a Christian. So... I was a okay. Christian who became an atheist, yeah. Okay, so the atheist Jewish and <laughs> okay, nevertheless, we came, we are our product of Western society. The two of us, we speak English. You much better than me, but nevertheless. And the idea of Western society is we focused on the self. Pico de la Mirandola said, oh, you just look at the self. We start the Renaissance, okay? We concentrate not on the deity, we concentrate on ourselves. But, and there is a great but, the concentration of the self gave us science, gave us technology, gave us many great things. But if you really want to pursue true happiness, you need to concentrate on the other. You need to just do good to other people. Now, you can debate what is good to other people, but you know, intuitively, like in your rational morality or objective morality, we know what doing good for other people. You know, you make other people like the focal point of your life. This is the only way one can pursue true happiness. And this is not like an objective to get true happiness. This is a byproduct of meaningful life. Meaningful life, which means that you put the other, which can be your spouse, your kids, your neighbor, your society, as a focal point instead of you. I think this is a very important lesson. Would you agree? I partially agree, but partially disagree. But I also wanted to say, you said there was an hour limit on a conversation. So I wanted to check on your time if you have more time or if not, because we are at the hour mark. Yes, yeah, three, 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 three minutes, okay? All right. So okay. the way I would disagree is that I think that people are different. Um, psychologically, biologically. And so I did a lot of, I, I had major depression in my childhood and I was doing a lot of searching to try and find ways to overcome that. 
And the sentiment that you just expressed was one of the things that I invested a lot of time in trying to explore, um, devoting time to helping others through um, volunteering my time at the Red Cross, at Habitats for Humanity, uh, Salvation Army, doing things to try and help other people. But it never made me feel better, not, not even a little bit. And so I think that it's wrong to generalize happiness to say that this, that devoting your life to other people makes, gives people true happiness. I don't think that's true. I think it's true for many people. And I think that that's evolutionarily the case that most people are biologically designed to get more dopamine from being around other people, specifically women and children. They get a lot of oxytocin from that, which is a really hard thing to get from anything else. And so they can probably get more fulfillment from children than anything else thanks to biology. But I think that to generalize that to all people would be inaccurate. I think there are many people like myself who don't get oxytocin or dopamine from helping others as much due to our psychological state. I was diagnosed with autism and people with autism don't have the same kind of an emotional connection to other people. And so they don't get the same kind of fulfillment from helping other people that most regular normal human people do. And so I think that it's True happiness is something that you should need to investigate on your individual basis based on how your brain and your biology works to understand what gives you fulfillment. And I think that's going to be different for each individual. And I think that the journey in being able to explore that can lead many people down worse roads. So I think the freedom that we're given to explore in the Western society uh, gives people the opportunity to make mistakes and to go down routes that make them unhappy, which is why there's more depression in many cases. Whereas in more societies where you're forced to work and you're forced to be with your family all the time, whether you like it or not, that will actually make more people who like families much happier because they enjoy being around more people. Whereas if they had the freedom to go out and live on their own, they probably would be less happy while they were trying to discover what they valued. And so I think that even though being forced to be in a family situation may make more people happy in general. I think the freedom to explore and discover for yourself what you truly value is a higher good, even if you can, even if you use that in a way that leads you to be unhappy. I think the freedom to explore is more important than simply the fulfillment of being forced to be around people, which will inherently make you happy due to your biology. Okay. So my take on that will be that it is not just helping other, like other people, okay? Because many people, you know, like misanthropic, they don't like to be around many people, which I think is absolutely true. The idea is that you are not the focal point. Maybe science is a focal point. Maybe, you know, building your own Christian, own unchristian objective quantum field church is the focal point. But make the make the something else the focal point of your life. And again, happiness is a byproduct. And what I say my students all the time, you know, we have the Disney notion, and we live in the Disney. We are. How old are you? Basically, thirty-four. Thirty-four. I I am forty-one. So we we got into you know we we grew to 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 many of the notions of Disney and some of the notions are destructive. For example, do what you love. Do what you love. Do what you love is sometimes, not always, but sometimes, mainly for millennials, is a destructive concept. Instead, like my role from Dead to Job said, instead do what you love, love what you do. Okay? Focus of, of what is meaningful, what is important, what is the focal point of your life? What is the most meaningful thing? And try to love this thing instead of, mm -mm, what do I love? Should I do this? Okay, you are not the focal point. Make something else the focal point of your life. And I think that's good advice for many people, but I think that many people can get fulfillment just from looking within, from being content with who they are instead of instead of trying to attribute value to something external, which I do. I, I, I like purpose and meaning, and the billionaires all like to derive value from some kind of goal and solving problems but not everyone i think i think it's i think it's up to the individual and sometimes some people can find value from just focusing on themselves and self improvements uh motivational speakers types and so i think that it's too limited to say that it's wrong to focus on yourself and that you should focus on other people i think that that's just a general rule 
that could be applied for many people, but I wouldn't want to say for everyone that this is the, the true method of happiness. I think that the true method of happiness is individual based on the individual, because I don't think it's the same for everyone, what will make them truly happy. And I think once we get to a point where we have artificial intelligence and it can solve all the problems for us, we can really find out for each individual what will make them happy rather than trying to give one general rule that applies to everyone. So let's agree to disagree. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, this is nice. First, if, if, if it, it was very nice conversation. I hope I, I uh, succeeded in articulating myself. I, I know I would do it differently in uh, in Hebrew. Nevertheless, oh, don't worry. Your English is better. Your English is better than most English speakers, so you're fine. Okay, this is fine. This is great, and uh, I I I invite all of the uh, commenters. How how many people are listening right now? hundred. Can, can you see it? One hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty. So I invite all the commenters to my YouTube channel, and I have many many English conversations with many interesting people. Most of them are secular and atheist. Most of them are Jewish because most scientists are. But most of them are secular and atheist, but we have m many great, very interesting conversations over there. So if you want, check, my, check, check out my channel. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>